Welcome to the latest Industry Insights podcast. Industry Insights is a reservoir of articles, interviews and other content relating to business, entrepreneurialism, leadership, charity, career pathways and networking. We'll be exploring the many opportunities in building the global integrative medicine community and how you can get involved. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us on the line today is Peter Berryman. Peter has been continuously in private practice as a natural medicine practitioner since 1985, having graduated from five different universities and three different colleges during his ongoing training, including his recent award with merit of a Master of Science from the University of Central Lancashire. Peter has continuously taught natural medicine students since 1990, most recently anatomy and physiology, pathology and clinical examination, as well as homeopathy, homeopathic pharmacy, homeopathic research and supervised student homeopathic clinic. Peter has been a director of the board of the Australian Traditional Medicine Society since 2007 and has been the president and chair of the ATMS board since February 2017. So today we're going to discuss a different offering to the highly charged registration debate in Australia, and that is co-regulation. Welcome to FX Medicine, Peter. How are you? Excellent today. Thank you, Andrew. Now, Peter, you've done a lot in your career. I'd like to investigate that a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about your history. I made a life-changing decision when I was the ripe old age of 14 years. Really? When one of my colleagues at school had a serious illness that affected her for 12 months took a year off school and no orthodox conventional medical doctor could help her at the time. She had glandular fever, mononucleosis, affected by the Epstein-Barr virus. And I made a life decision at 14 that I wanted to be the type of person who could help people who were not being helped by conventional medicine of the day. Wow. And everything I've ever done since I started university at 16 has always been to that purpose. So all of my studies have all been towards being able to help those who've not been helped by anyone else. So tell me why was it that why to why go down that homeopathic naturopathic field? What was it that drew you towards that? Were your parents of that mind or um, I was of some fortune you might say to be the youngest of four children and older siblings were in conventional medicine. Yeah. And they were able to tell me about its limitations and that its limitations were much higher than might have been publicly aware of. They mm. were able to tell me in private and encouraged me to find a better way. Right. And so at that era, uh, we're talking about the 70s and 80s, um, there wasn't much awareness of natural medicine. And uh, I, I, through, through a number of evolutionary steps, I found my way towards science, um, natural therapies. I, I was very fortunate to do um, uh, a naturopathic undergraduate course, which... Is, is great because it's an eclectic base. In, in those days, it was four major modalities and a good number of minors. So having been exposed to nutrition and herbal medicine and massage and homeopathy, I was then able to make a personal decision about which one of those I wanted to master um, rather than be a, a jack of all trades. Yeah. I decided to commit myself to what, what I, in my opinion, was the pick of the bunch the hardest one to do and the one that had the least limitations and the greatest benefits. Um, I had the opportunity in my training to to go to student clinic and do my very best at all of those modalities. And it was obvious to me which one had the best outcome, which one had the least limitations and which was relevant, therefore, to my life decision about wanting to be able to help those who were not helped by others. So that's been my niche for the last 30-odd years is the most difficult clients. And I feel that's what um, natural therapies in Australia is, is about because there is a, a wonderful marketplace of choice out there for the Australian public. Um, most of our parents and grandparents were socialised to going just to conventional Western doctors, but now you're spoiled for choice. There, There's so much choice out there, and that's great because each person will find who they're looking for. And if they have not been helped by conventional medicine, 
they can choose to go into the private sector and find out what does acupuncture offer, what does chiropractic offer, what does homeopathy offer. And eventually, one would hope, they would find who they're looking for and get the outcome that they're looking for. Mm. So that's that's the uh, the respect I have of all the other modalities out there. They're there for everyone, and people will find who they're looking for. Um, the reputation of homeopathy, even if not as well known as a, um, the word naturopath, is that um, it has a reputation of being able to help those who are the most difficult clients. Now, most people can help, most practitioners can help simple, uncomplicated problems, and and many of those are, are relatively straightforward and might be um, lifestyle advice, um, reasonably common sense things. But when it comes down to practicing medicine, I feel that homeopathy, in my personal opinion, is the most effective, least limited modality out there. You know, we used to um, have homestay students some years ago, and I was quite surprised with our South American students from Brazil two of them. And they told me that over in Brazil, it's homeopathy that is the medicine of choice, the medical system of choice for the people, unless you've got oodles of money, um, because it's, it's the only one that's cheap. You know, pharmaceuticals cost heaps and heaps of money. So the general populace actually chooses homeopathy as their, their preferred system of, of medicine. Yes, indeed. So Brazil is an excellent international case study. So is uh, India. Um, where, uh, again, there's a, a large choice available to the public, um, but all are supported by the government. Um, in India, there's something like 275 homeopathic hospitals, something like 295,000 homeopaths, um, something like 14% of all hospital beds in India are homeopathic hospitals. So it's a, a modality that's capable of delivering outcomes to the point of running a hospital. Uh, we see that in, in, in South America as well, but I guess the, the dilemma with Brazil is it's um, language isolation, speaking Portuguese, yeah. um, not such a common international language these days. So uh, that's possibly why we don't know so much about the fabulous things going on in Brazil. Mm, I, I was quite surprised about Louisa's, particularly Louisa's um, experience and, and what she told me about how their family took care of themselves. Indeed, and, and something similar to that is what's going on in Cuba. Um, whatever your thoughts are about Cuba, it has arguably the best public health care system in the world. Um, and homeopathy is a significant choice amongst the modalities of intervention that the Cuban doctors use. Peter, I want to get back onto this um, registration issue. So, But first, I think we need to investigate and learn a little bit more about you with your experience with the Australian Traditional Medicine Society. Tell us about the history of the ATMS. Indeed, you know, like I remember I've spoken to Dennis Stewart about years ago, you know, the sort of pre-registration debate back in the, what was it, late 60s, early 70s. But how was the ATMS set up? And, you know, what was the dream of registration, if you like, back then? And how's it changed? How's it evolved? ATMS was set up by um, the grand old dame of Australian herbal medicine, a lady most people know called Dorothy Hall. And she set it up as a reaction to another professional association that set up shortly prior who had um, standards of entry um, relatively limiting. There were a significant number of practitioners who could not join this other association and were left over. So Dorothy collected all of these people and formed ATMS. So it's, in a gotcha. sense, been the underdog. And it's now Australia's largest multimodality natural medicine association. It has well over 10,000 accredited members practicing. We have 24 registered modalities that we look after. So we're big. We're bigger than all of the competition. We have, you know, I think it's something like 65% of the industry are our members. Part of that, though, would be, obviously, because you – embrace more modalities than some of the others? Like, for instance, one is a herbal registration. Yes. So so there, there are single modality associations out there, like, uh, you know, look after just Western herbal medicine or look after just acupuncture or look after just homeopathy. And uh, by definition, their numbers would be limited because the total number of practitioners just doing that modality would be 
um, relatively smaller than an eclectic association. So the value of the eclecticism in ATMS is when it comes to numbers, when numbers count. And when they count is politically and financially. So, for example, ATMS has excellent financial assets, um, the envy of most other associations. Um, we have excellent lobbying powers when it comes to our recent trips to Canberra, for example, um, getting appointments to see ministers and ombudsmen and senators and so forth. They will listen to us because they say, well, who do you represent? And if we say we represent you know, 10,000 plus members, they go, oh, okay, so you've got a few votes behind you. Yes, we'll have an appointment with you. So this is the, the way that the political halls work. <laughs> yes, yes. If we've got the, the money to fund our strategic plan and if we have the staff to be able to do it, if we have the CEO and the company secretary and a board structure and we can afford to do all those things, we can make a difference. And we are. We're very proud of our achievements and we've been doing this for 32 years now. And and how has that dream of registration, or as you put it, the co-regulation, how has that changed and evolved over the years? Well, there's, there's things of flip-flops. Um, and if registration, statutory registration was seriously contemplated by parliamentarians, government, we would entertain it. But our position is that um, it's neither justified nor achievable in the current environment. Now, as the current environment changed, we are adaptable, we are you know, um, uh, adjustable, we, we're not absolutely stuck in a rut, but this is our position for the moment and it serves us well. And that is that we support the current status quo where as a professional association we have a code of conduct, we have a complaints mechanism, um, we have the capacity within our constitution to expel members and so we can look after our own. There's also currently, almost in all states and territories of Australia, uh, negative licensing. So even without statutory registration, there, there is a, a relatively informal scene of co-regulation, co-registration happening in Australia at the moment. Now, it's not being formalised, but the status quo is effectively a co-registration situation. The spectre, if you like, of registration co-regulation has raised its head in the last couple of years because of an unlicensed, as far as, I, as, far as I'm aware, um, person posing as a naturopath. Uh, at least that's how the media purported her to be. They also purported her to be a midwife, but she doesn't appear on APRA under the nurses and midwives uh, list. But um, her conduct basically sent a child into hospital. What is the state of play with regards to a bona fide practitioner being registered with an association and therefore, I guess, the safety of the community with that. What are the issues surrounding this? Well, that's why I mentioned we, we have our own internal policies and procedures. We have our own code of conduct. It's a living document. We've just updated ours recently to make it in tune with what's going on in all the Australian states and territories. We have a complaints committee. Uh, so we can action complaints that come from um, members, mm. practitioners, um, the public, uh, manufacturers and so forth, um, and we can take some action upon that. Uh, we recommend remedial action, for example, uh, if they need to attend some educational institution and learn about record keeping, for example, or if they've had a problem with not having adequate records, or if it, you know. So, so we 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 have some internal resources to cope with our own. Yeah. Um, and and um, we, we can suspend and expel members as well. Um, but with negative licensing from um, the states and territories, they can actually prohibit um, a practitioner from practicing for a finite or an indefinite period as well. So the, the, that situation is probably pretty good as far as what we can do internally and what um, governments can do state and federally externally as well. So so the, the, the most problematic people can actually be stopped from practising and stopped from practising if they would choose to move around Australia as well. Right, okay. So if the practitioner was uh, a member of another registration, obviously the, the complainant would have to find out who they're registered with and, and uh, um, 
complain to the appropriate regist- um, association. That's right. So we have on our website publicly available, um, uh, find the practitioner. So if they know the name of the person, they can make a, a legitimate um, fill in a form, make a complaint, and your process will take care of itself. And they'll be informed all the way through of what the process is in natural justice. Gotcha. So, so we're fairly happy that we do what we can for our own. Now, we, you're alluding to, in a sense, protection of title. We, we don't have license to protect those titles, all the 24 titles that we look after, the modalities. So we can't stop someone calling themselves a naturopath, not being registered, not being a member of an association and doing um, unpleasant things. So we can't stop that. But if a complaint is made, um, then the negative licensing by government can take care of that if we can't take care of because they're not ours. They're not one of ours. We can take care of ours, um, but those who do do things who are not a member of an association, um, that's when the the, the government can take care of the public that way. What exactly are we talking about here with health practitioner registration or co-regulation? Now that we're into, you know, the new millennium, the 2000s, what's it for? What's its purpose? What are we aiming for here? It's principally for the benefit of the public, to minimise the risk to the public of um, adverse drug reactions or fraud or uh, some other malevolent activities so that the public are protected. And so what there needs to be perceived is a, a significant or serious risk by any health modality. And there, there are a number of health modalities that do have statutory registration that there is deemed to be sufficient risk. Osteopathy, chiropractic, and recently acupuncture. So um, for other natural medicine modalities to be um, needing to be registered, there would need to be a significant risk. Now, yes, there are occasionally mishaps and occasionally deaths, related to work done by natural medicine practitioners of who may or may not be in an association. But if we compare this to the type of serious risk involved in conventional Western medicine or other um, allied health, um, the, the risk is very small. And therefore, the other implications in terms of cost-benefit of having um, set up uh, registration boards, the uh, red tape and bureaucratic uh, involvement in maintaining those, the cost and so forth, don't make it worthwhile. I'm totally understanding that, you know, I, one of the reasons I love natural medicine is, is it's so forgiven, forgiving. <laughs> but I do also believe that you can get people who either through no fault of their own, either an idiosyncratic reaction or through this... Um, you know, I'm going to call it misadventure or, or mis- malpractice, but what we're finding is that these people aren't really licensed to practice naturopathy. The people who have actually had the, the education team seem not to pose that risk to the public. That's right. So that's one of the reasons for having a professional association is so that graduates from a, a, a good college uh, and ATMS can process those who say this is an ATMS recognised education provider and these are recognised programs from them. So students or the public can select a a program that is known to be of high quality according to our own internal industry jurisdiction. And they can graduate and then they can become a member of our association and therefore the public can have some confidence that the uh, practitioners that are members of ATMS are safe and competent. They've been educated to a, a standard of excellence and that should there be a problem, there is um, policies and procedures for um, natural justice to come about. Now, you know, no one's perfect and nothing is absolutely safe. So there will always be small problems, minor problems, um, and we have the, the policies and procedures to take care of those. And we don't feel that for the cost and time and bureaucratic red tape, that it's worthwhile these other natural therapies requiring statutory registration. Now, um, co-regulation is, is, co-registration is is the current status quo. So what you're alluding to is something above and beyond that acupuncture experienced five years ago and osteopathy and chiropractor experienced 30 or 40 years ago. So if, if we look at the example of 
what has happened to acupuncture as a consequence of being statutory registered, it hasn't seemingly benefited them greatly. It's cost them more. They're more tied up in red tape. They have lots of issues, for instance, around English language competency skills, for example. Um, and the, uh, the potential benefits haven't really flourished for acupuncturists. So uh, if it's perceived that acupuncture has that much risk associated with it, that the public need greater protection by doing this to the industry of acupuncturists, um, it, it hasn't really gone well for the acupuncturists to have gone down this pathway. Oh, okay. So I don't really, I don't really see it as being great benefit to the Western medical herbalists or the nutritionists or the naturopaths or the homeopaths uh, and so forth. So um, it, it's not really worth it. Right. What, what about chiropractic, though? I mean, they seem to be well entrenched with APRA. They get attacked every, very so often by the Friends of Science yes. and Medicine. But, but um, you know, they, they really do enjoy, um, as far as I'm aware, um, forgive me, I'm a registered nurse. I'm not, I'm not a chiropractor. But, um, you know, they really seem to enjoy the, the protection of being under APRA. Yes, they do. And um, chiropractic osteopathic education is thriving in Australian universities in spite of critics who would like to change all that. Mm. Um, Thank and the, the Australian Medical Association have been battling against the chiropractors forever. Mm. And, you know, things go up and down, better and worse, but they're still surviving. So um, although I have met chiropractors who would like to suggest that this whole registration has not done their industry as much good as some would like to say. Oh, okay. So there would be contrary opinions as well. So let's talk about co-registration or co-regulation. What do you see as the benefits of that? And if we, you know, we alluded to it at the beginning about um, protection of title, would you be able to get protection of title with a co-registration model? No, co-registration is the model that is, is informally right now. So what you're alluding to, I think, is, is statutory registration, which is where we would have protection of title, right. but um, the industry would be out of our hands. So at the moment, with the status quo, we still have some capacity to make some difference on some things, and that's good because we haven't lost our industry to government who may have different agendas than our agendas for our own industry. But how would that differ from like acupuncture and chiropractic, if you like? Are you saying that chiropractic aren't in control of their profession? They, they are answerable to their boards. Right. And uh, if their boards are made up of bureaucrats, yeah. then what happened to chiropractic? So we don't want to have that happen to these other modalities, these ones that are not statutory registered, so that we can maintain some control and address issues um, that we've outlined in our um, position statement so that we can still suggest what the education standards are. We can suggest what continuing professional education looks like. We can dictate the costs involved in becoming a professional member. Um, we can negotiate a suitable and relatively low professional and damage insurance premium. Um, we can still encourage um, the art of medicine as well as the science of medicine in our traditional practices. Um, we can advocate on our own behalf rather than having to be um, uh, under the total control of government agencies. Um, we can promote ourselves in the way we like to and take the industry in the direction that we want to rather than be dictated to by bureaucrats. Right. We feel that, that we would rather be able to participate in our industry and in a co-regulatory way because we're able to do that within the scope that we have as an association. And then government bureaucrats outside that through their negative licensing do what they can to, to those who don't belong to an association and do Mr. What about the issue of scope of practice? Like, um, you know, I've said it before and I don't know whether I'm right. I've just said it. <laughs> um, I, th this is my ponderings, is that a herbalist knows that they're a herbalist. A nutritionist knows that they're a nutritionist and there are boundaries around that. Um, naturopath seems to be, well, I do this sort of naturopathy and whereas an, they can go and shake hands with a naturopath who practices two doors down and they'll do a, a naturopathy but with a completely yeah. set, different set of skills um, or choices. Um, so is that part of the issue of this um, of scope of practice range not, and indeed registration? So much. No, it's just an unfortunate consequence that Australia 
took this term naturopath from North American natural medicine practitioners. Right. In Europe, um, the word naturopath is not so well known. I mean, you might know in German they could use the term Heilpraktika. But um, what you were saying in comparison to the word naturopath, these other modalities are quite specific. When you say Western herbal medicine, we know somewhat precisely what you do. When you say nutrition, we know somewhat precisely what you do. And homeopath, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are singular modalities, whereas the term naturopath, of all the terms that we could come up with, is an eclectic term. It doesn't precisely say what you do. Yeah. So when I trained as a as a naturopath in the 80s, there were four major modalities and about 10 minor modalities under the umbrella. Um, so, and, and I, as I said in my early introduction, I was grateful for that because it gave me an early introduction to so many so that I could choose which ones did I prefer and want to go on to, 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 to excel and master in. Um, and, and I still see that as a benefit and I, and I still welcome that, that eclectic base for being a naturopath. But when you're talking about scope of practice, uh, it is a bit of a problem. Mm. So, um, so you know, currently in, in some of the education institutions here in Australia, a naturopath could be more specifically a nutritionist and a herbalist, a Western herbal medicine practitioner. Yeah. They tend to not have as a major modality anything else. Now, they do some minors and this and that and the other thing, but those are their two major modalities. So uh, the term naturopath might need to be addressed. To me, it might be one of those terms like antioxidant. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we might need to evolve it. <laughs> no, but if we understand that, that a naturopath is an eclectic term, um, someone who is a naturopath might have to say, well, yes, I am a naturopath, but that's based on my... Um, you know, majors in herbal medicine and nutrition. So if I'm, you know, in terms of being in a list or a table of practitioners, put me in the list of this and that rather than having a, a list of naturopaths because you could you could be, a, well, the, the word naturopath, I think, came from a historical word called a hygienist. Yeah. And hygienism was the roots of naturopathy, and this was the idea of clean living. Yeah. You know, exercise, having fresh air, yeah. mm. fresh food, um, those sorts of things. And, and that got divided up into all these different modalities today. So, um, so yes, there's, there's infinite number of modalities. So if people have skills and training in specific one or two or ten, um, I think that could, we could solve some of these scope of practice and um, these naming issues. Not too bad. Not yes, too hard. I'm just wondering whether it might be something akin to a GP has their scope of practice defined by medicine, orthodox medicine, but a GP can quite likely do dry needling because they might have done a certificate in that. Um, now, it's not acupuncture and it's not defined as acupuncture. It tends to be putting needles in somebody for, for that sort of relief, but it, um, you know, I guess tends to, from a GP perspective, be dare I say the word, limited to more things like pain relief. Um, is that the sort? Is that where you're getting going with this? Is sort of like, you know, the sort of base um, core definition would be the nutritionist herbal medicine and then you add on there are certain interests, if you like, that you practice. Well, again, back to this um, risk to the public, we want the public to have access to as many choices of medical care as they wish and to to have safe and competent practitioners. So if, if uh, a member of the public went to see an ATMS member for some dry needling, um, we would want that, that person to have excellence in that and be recognized as a competent, safe practitioner rather than someone who wasn't because we want their experience to be as well as can be given the givens and um, as mostly happens. So perhaps the, 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 the dilemma with the term Naturopath is probably probably more comparable to the term um, government employee. If you're a ah, public servant, well done. If you're a public servant, um, what, what do you do? What precisely do you do? <laughs> yeah, and it's right. not precise because you could be a teacher, you could be a fireman, you could be you could be doing. So so if if I said, look, I'm a homeopath and I'm specialised in homeopathy and I'm a classical homeopath following Samuel Hahnemann, that's very precise. 
Right. Um, so it, this sort of thing could be sorted with with um, a scope of practice. Um, and the only word I can think of that would be um, the greatest problem would be this word naturopath, which is arguably mm. the most common and used word in Australia. Um, but in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe or in in um, in, in India, um, these other words are very common. Um, we may not know them so well here, like Ayurveda and Yunani, uh, as as well as um, traditional Chinese medicine and homeopathy and Western medicine and so forth. So I think um, that the public would get used to that in time, uh, again, through, through these legislative pathways if necessary and these association pathways. Because, you know, if you looked at the 24 modalities that ATIMS looks after, you might recognize half of them, but half of them you'd say, what's Bowen therapy? Yeah. And and, and what's Alexander technique? Yep. And and Uteka, Price, what's yeah. that? Yes. Yeah. So you might say, geez, these are strange sounding names, but these are very specific modalities and people in the know know precisely what they are. And for those who have benefited from them, they'd say, I you know, I, I just love my, my therapist doing this for me. Mm. So we want there to be choice. We want all of these available, but we want them to be safe to the public so that the public are looked after. Peter, what about um award wage and career path for naturopaths. This has been a bugbear for quite a while. Are there any plans in place, any hopes, dreams um, to be able to create an award wage that that people can, um, you know, be promised? Well, natural medicine functions pretty much in the private sector and th- there aren't awards, as far as I know, to govern that. And the the naive hope has been a link to Medicare, but Medicare is not particularly affordable. The Australian government is struggling with its budget deficit, including the significant um, costs to the PBS and the -the over-the-counter drugs and the other uh, related health industries like uh, optometry and dental, which are ancillary along with natural therapies and the private health insurance coverage there. So with with the cost of conventional medicine rising – any naive hope of natural medicine joining in on um, Medicare benefits is is not likely. Um, And we're having a current campaign addressing the government support for private health insurance rebates for natural medicine. They want to take the money that they're contributing out and put it into the budget deficit without truly considering the impact of what they're doing. Now, that Um, I don't understand. Well, it's it's a short-term quick fix to the budget deficit, but the economic rationalisation is relatively small. The the amount of money that would be saved is is in talking in tens of millions of dollars, not billions of dollars. And the the compromise to the twenty eight thousand small business uh, enterprises that happen in natural medicine won't like that because that might make the difference between um, success and failure, or opening or closing for a small business person to lose. Um, the income that that comes from for, um, say, particularly body workers, where they uh, seem to be quite reliant on um, the small rebates that they get from um, people who have private health insurance and get those rebates. So we're, we're campaigning on that at the moment. So um, we, we aren't allowed to do price fixing. We aren't allowed to make strong recommendations by an association for what a cost of a consultation would be. So um, the, the market dictates this. So um, the, 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 an award wage um, is, is not particularly realistic at the current industry. Um, there, there have been surveys of the industry to see what sort of money is being made by practitioners, uh, and it's very varied between, um, uh, say, a, a middle-aged female who may have a family and a partner, Who's working, you know, school-friendly hours out of her front room, um, some days a week, while her partner is the major breadwinner, and she might be earning twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year. Through to um, men who are single and have um, multiple um, practices, earning, you know, six-figure incomes. So. Uh, there's quite a dichotomy in the industry between well, what is possible from a, a relatively um, you know, moderate second income for a family through to uh, a significant income uh, as a major interest. So there's, there's, um, there's lots of opportunities to, 
to work in natural medicine from the obvious one of, of being in a private practice. Um, or you, you could go on and be an academic educator and higher research, postgraduate research is a, is a definite pathway there. Yeah. There are a good number of Australian universities offering um, postgraduate programs in, in natural therapies, uh, you know, highly respected Australian universities as well. Um, the, there are opportunities in manufacturing and retail as, as well. So um, these are probably the, the most common uh, career pathways. Um, but uh, like anyone in small business, um, there's a significant dropout rate of graduates. And one of the things that we try and do as an association is provide mentoring and support for new graduates in those early difficult years when they're struggling to get their competency in business skills as well as their um, practitioner skills and keep them in the industry so that they can have a long and successful career. I know this changes each time we change government, and that's exceedingly frequent over the past seven years in Australia. But what does the government want from naturopaths? Well, they they want our um, tax dollars, and we contribute something like four point one billion dollars into the industry, uh, into the government from being in the industry and not being in the black market. Our legitimate income. Um, they want us to provide choice to the public because they are probably smart enough and savvy enough to know that um, there are good stories to be had around natural medicine. In our recent visits to Canberra doing some lobbying, each of the politicians we spoke to had an aside, an anecdote about a good experience with natural therapies, every one of them. And so they would probably want that to continue, this idea of choice and access and good outcomes and particularly good outcomes where um, previous uh, experiences were not so good with other practitioners, with conventional doctors. So um, they would want that to continue because politicians are human and they've been touched by disease and ill health and tragedy and death as much as anyone else. Mm. So they would like that choice as well. And we were quite surprised how many politicians like their Pilates classes or their yoga classes or take homeopathic medicines or take um, nutritional and herbal supplements and so forth and are improved by that experience and therefore have this um, private tacit support um, to do so. So we're, we're endeavouring to continue to make that difference um, to everyone, including politicians, so that uh, our, our reputation stays you know, excellent. Mm. So um, we're trying our hardest to, to, to provide the public with safe and competent practitioners. So um, the, the, the board of ATMS... Uh, well-trained, I mean, given my example of my biography, I'm, I'm recognised through both orthodox and unconventional training as someone who knows what they're talking about. And here I am addressing issues of education so that the people who follow behind me get a, as good as an education as possible, as rigorous and as safe as possible and as competent as possible to do a good job. And if they have problems, if they need support or if they have an adverse drug reaction or a complaint made against them, then we take care of our own that way. And so we, we do an excellent job, dare I say, about what we're doing for our own industry. Hmm. And we, we do recognise the role of government to make sure that the issues that we've touched on before with negative licensing are taken care of as well. So I think the Australian public are pretty lucky that they have the situation, the status quo, as it is, and we would like to support the status quo, and including what we, we mentioned earlier about supporting the continuing um, government money in private health insurance rebates, because in a sense that takes some of the pressure off the public system and diverts it into the private system, and that's where we thrive, and the government is, is doing a good thing there, or has been, um, and we, hope, we wish they would continue to do so. Yeah, so yeah. Um, Australia is pretty, pretty damn lucky. Right well, now. this is the thing. Like we are the lucky country. And it was actually a pharmacist that said this to me years ago when I was perhaps a little bit overzealous in my support of natural medicines. Um, and and she, she didn't placate me. She admonished me. Um, she, she admonished me and said, well, hang on. You know, obviously, don't forget your your orthodox medical training. She said it's not about favouring one or the other; it's about choice. 
you know, and as I said before, the friends of science in medicine would say that we need to protect, you know, we are the good ones and we need to protect the public from you, the bad ones, the natural health practitioners. I would gain say in that there was a very small study done at um, the Alfred Hospital. If we're talking about the Medicare and private medical fund rebates, I totally agree with you about Medicare. That, that is a separate issue. Uh, but private medical fund rebates for those people that have private medical funds, uh, there was a very small study done at a cardiac centre and just doing a foot massage on people who had been through cardiac surgery and they didn't want to touch the torso because of drips, drains, cracks, sternums and things like that, but just massaging the foot and they had dramatic decreases in the use of opioids, which is a societal problem in Australia. So pain medications, but also in other medications as well, the need for other medications, which plays into the role of stress, obviously, and their <laughs> outcomes from cardiac surgery. Just doing a foot massage. Now, if people could get, continue to get private medical fund rebates for that, you've got a cost saving for Australian um, tax dollar, haven't you? Well, this, this is a dilemma for the government. They are in between the lobbying power of conventional medicine, including the Australian Medical Association and the pharmaceutical industries, and on the other hand, the Australian public who love what natural medicine practitioners yeah. do. We have the numbers to suggest that there are more consultations held per annum in Australia with natural medicine practitioners than there are with conventional GPs, that the Australian public are prepared to pay out of their own pocket after tax dollars for natural medicine products, more money is spent on natural medicine products than money is spent on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme and over-the-counter drugs. So the Australian public love what we do and they're prepared to support it in this way. So the, the politicians would know that. And here they are between these two parties. Here, here the, the associations like ATMS are trying to support this choice and the, the, the politicians are stuck in the middle. They have to seemingly please everyone and no one. So the, 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 the battle, it's a bit of a turf war. It's, it's about yeah, money yeah. and power. That's what and, it is. And, and, and the history of medicine, over the long period, there have been you know, ups and downs as to who's dominant. And at the moment, the dominant power is conventional Western medicine. I would dare say they are in decline, and natural medicine is on the rise. We've been on the rise since the 1970s, 80s, particularly the 1990s in education. We see these numbers ex, 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 getting big. Well, we've had a uh, in in the last 10 years, we've seen a doubling in the size of the industry. Um, so we're, we're truly a growth industry. We're on the way up, uh, and that's why here in Brisbane recently, I've been surprised to see on the sides of buses something I've never seen before: advertisements for GPs. Now, why? Mm -hmm. The GPs suddenly need to advertise because they are losing on the battleground. They are losing financially and economically, uh, politically, um, and natural medicine is, is who they see as the opposition, and they don't like that. Yeah. They once upon a time had a monopoly. They don't like losing that. They don't want to share the, the medical pie that is – and natural medicine's on the rise. And so we're starting to utilise this political and economic power, and we're trying to um, improve the health of Australians for the sake of Australians. It's not just about our money and our power. We're much more, um, how would we say, empathetic to the Australian public. We want to see the Australians improve, and, and that's a global thing. We want to see yeah. the health of the world improve by the increased patronage to natural medicine. And this is why the World Health Organization do recognize that traditional and indigenous medicines are the dominant medical paradigms around the world and that the cost involved in orthodox conventional Western medicine is just too high a price to pay for the general public. And so that's why they would like to encourage the utilization of natural medicines. We, we feel that we have a genuine uh, option to provide that is effective and uh, as I've alluded to with what we've done in the association, we're making sure that, that the practitioners who are our members are safe and competent and do a uh, do a, um, an excellent job for the Australian public. So we're, we're very grateful that we will tolerate it by the Australian public and we don't mind competing so long as it was a relatively even playing field, which it's not. So conventional Western medicine do have an advantage of having Medicare support and 
and all sorts of other support that we don't have. But even so, I think we're, we're um, fighting above our weight and we're doing quite well in this battle. So we expect to see natural medicine continue to rise and improve and do excellent things for Australian public. One last question, Peter. You've got, you know, within APRA, in, indeed, let's just concentrate on GPs. You've got the Rural GP Association, you've got this association, that association, but you've got a, a major lobbying arm, the AMA, and you've got a major college, the RACGP, the Royal Australian College of GPs. So you've got a, a college and a, a lobbying association, if you like. Where do you think Australia needs to go with regards to all of the associations getting together and having one lobbying group? Well, ATMS is the largest, has attempted over the last 10 years to get cooperation amongst all of the private natural medicine associations. But unfortunately, it's been a 10-year failure. The only time that the, the natural medicine associations do all come together is when there's a common external um, issue to be addressed, like right. we did around, say, GST, or um, now, for example, with um, the, the, the rebates being pulled by governments. Yep. So where there's something relatively external, we do, but it's, it's again, uh, the unfortunate issues around, dare I say, egos, that, that there's been this lack of um, uh, unity amongst the natural medicine associations. And if we did, oh my God, would we have some, what Marcus Blackmore called some political horsepower. <laughs> um, Marcus was critical um, at a speech he did when we had a healthy breakfast in the, in the um, Senate in May for our Natural Medicine Week, and he said it was really good to see ATMS at last utilising its political horsepower. He's been watching for 50 years for us to get going, and now we have, and given those numbers I was suggesting about how the government, uh, how the Australian public are supporting us, I think the Australian public can look forward to an improved opportunity to utilise excellence in natural medicine education, natural medicine patronage, uh, natural medicine products for um, their improved health. So we're on the rise. Watch out, Australia. Here we come. <laughs> Words well said. Peter Berryman, thanks for joining us on FX Medicine today. Welcome. Thank you, Andrew. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew whitfield Cook. This podcast is brought to you by the ATMS, the Australian Traditional Medicine Society. If you enjoyed today's podcast, you can find more Industry Insights podcasts and resources under the Community tab on the FX Medicine website.